Let's talk about the Enchanted sequel. If you've been watching this channel for a while now, then you know that I have a soft spot when it comes to Disney films, and in the past I've compared different versions of their most iconic characters, reviewed their live-action remakes, and debunked some of the most popular fan theories. Like a lot of people, I've been rather disappointed with Disney's recent releases, partly because I feel as though they're missing the magic that made me fall in love with them to begin with, something that is especially noticeable in their live-action projects. When they first announced a sequel to 2007's Enchanted, one of my favorite Disney movies, I was equal parts excited and concerned, understandably so because Disney doesn't have the best track record when it comes to sequels. In today's video, I'll be taking a look at Disney's Disenchanted. I'll be explaining what I did and didn't like about it, as well as some of the changes I'd personally make. As always, this is my opinion, so it's totally fine if you don't agree. And of course, there will be spoilers. Let's get into it. Just to provide some background information in case it's been a while since you saw the first film, Enchanted follows Giselle, a beautiful young woman from the animated land of Andalasia who is magically transported by the evil queen Nerissa to New York City in order to prevent her from marrying Prince Edward. Where did you send her? To a place where there are no happily ever afters. While in the city, Giselle's fairy tale naivete results in her becoming lost, but she eventually comes across Robert and his daughter Morgan, who allow her to stay at their apartment until she's able to get home. Giselle's chipmunk friend, Pip, journeys with Edward to the real world in order to find her, being joined by Nathaniel, Nerissa's henchman who is sent to kill Giselle. Even though Giselle's fairy tale sensibilities continue to cause misunderstandings, including making Robert's fiance Nancy think he's cheating on her, her kindness and optimism make both Robert and Morgan grow attached to her. As she spends more time in the city, Giselle becomes human, experiencing emotions like anger and sadness that she'd never felt in Andalasia. Oh, you are unhappy. I am so sorry. Oh, I'm not unhappy. I'm angry. Angry? Yes, it's an unpleasant emotion. Have you ever heard of it? Oh, I have heard of it. Okay. Edward is eventually able to find Giselle, but before heading home to Andalasia, she asks if they can attend a ball, hoping to go on a real date where they can get to know each other before getting married. At the ball, Giselle dances with Robert, with both realizing that they've developed feelings for each other, but with both accepting that they won't be able to be together. Nerissa arrives and poisons Giselle, with the only way to break the curse being true love's kiss. After Edward's kiss fails, Robert gives it a try, and Giselle awakens, infuriating Nerissa who transforms into a dragon and takes Robert hostage. Giselle takes Edward's sword and pursues Nerissa herself, subverting Disney's damsel in distress trope, and with Pip's help, Giselle is able to defeat her. The film ends with Edward and Nancy falling in love and marrying one another in Andalasia, while Giselle becomes a fashion designer and starts a happy life with Robert and Morgan in New York. Disenchanted is set 10 years after the events in the original film, with Giselle's family deciding to move from Manhattan to the small town of Monroeville following the birth of their child, Sophia. Edward and Nancy visit the family at their new home, giving them a magic wand that can only be used by a true Andalasian. After an assortment of hiccups, they all become increasingly dissatisfied with suburban life, with Giselle yearning for her storybook ending, Robert becoming disheartened by the fact that he has to commute to work, and Morgan becoming frustrated with having to move against her will. After an argument with Morgan, Giselle wishes all of their troubles could disappear, and the following morning she wakes up to find the town transformed, now having talking animals, singing appliances, and dancing townspeople. Besides Giselle and Pip, no one remembers their past lives, with Morgan becoming a stereotypical Disney princess, Robert believing that he's a brave adventurer, and Malvina turning into an evil queen with magical powers. While Giselle initially thinks that this is an improvement, she discovers that she's inadvertently cast a spell on herself, which begins to turn her into a wicked stepmother, the villain in Morgan's fairy tale. After being pushed into the magic wishing well by Giselle, Morgan is brought to Andalasia, where her memory is restored and she sets out to save Giselle with her memory tree, an arts and crafts project from her childhood. Giselle attends the town festival where she meets Malvina and the two have a magical duel. Morgan arrives and tosses the memory tree to Giselle, who rips it up, but its magic is able to turn her back to normal anyway. Malvina captures Morgan and forces Giselle to hand over the wand, which she destroys. 
As the clock strikes midnight, Giselle and Morgan reconcile, with Giselle telling her that she has to make the wish that will turn everything back to normal, and Morgan wishes that she was back home with her mother. Morgan wakes up and discovers that everything is back to normal, with only her and Giselle remembering what has occurred, with everyone else believing it was all a strange dream. Giselle later apologizes to Malvina for their rivalry, who in turn allows Giselle to join the town council. Robert moves his practice to Monroeville so he doesn't have to commute anymore, while Morgan begins a relationship with Malvina's son, Tyson. The end. Now that you know what happens in Disenchanted, let's take a look at what worked and what didn't. What made Enchanted unique is the way that it was able to capture the heart of a traditional Disney film while making adjustments for a contemporary audience, but in a way that didn't come off as patronizing or disingenuous. It highlighted the differences between reality and fantasy, but also where the two overlapped. By satirizing classic fairy tale tropes and subverting expectations of the genre, it was equally as funny as it was intelligent. And by having Giselle evolve from a caricature of a Disney princess to someone real, she ushered in a new type of female protagonist. I explain this more in my video on the evolution of the princess formula, so I'd recommend checking that out since I can't really get into it here. In comparison to the first film, Disenchanted's message feels significantly more shallow. I have no issue with the film pivoting its focus to the relationship between Giselle and Morgan, but it doesn't really add anything new to the concept. The two struggle to see eye to eye thanks to Giselle's fairy tale sensibilities and Morgan's growing teenage angst, a dynamic that we've seen play out time and time again in the Disney universe, with Merida and Eleanor and Ariel and Triton coming to mind. My mother? Mm -hmm. She is not my mother. She's my stepmother. Overall, the disintegration of Giselle and Morgan's relationship feels incredibly forced and rushed, as does their reconciliation. And I feel like the first film did a better job of showing their mother-daughter connection than this one did. Is this what it's like? What, sweetie? Going shopping with your mother? I don't know, I've never been shopping with my mother. Me either. But I like it. Me too. Plus, Morgan's entire, I'm a teenager, of course I'm moody thing is incredibly cliche, which I'd be fine with if it was actually explored in an interesting way. Giselle's initial story arc in the first film contradicted the usual Disney princess formula by having her meet Edward and believe him to be her true love until she meets and falls in love with Robert. But the only way Disenchanted strays from the norm is by having Giselle, the parent figure, use faulty magic to change their fate instead of the child. Speaking of magic, I don't really like the film's use of wands and wishes. It feels too simple and straightforward. There's no subversion of the trope like there had been in the original film. All of the blame is placed on Giselle when it should really be something that both she and Morgan are involved with because they're both responsible for the strain on their relationship. What I would have preferred is if they'd made unintentional wishes that were interpreted incorrectly by magic, with one wishing on a star and the other using the wishing well. Then, instead of that random arts and crafts project being what breaks Giselle's curse, you could still include the magic wand, but not have it work for Morgan until she's able to reconcile with Giselle and become a true Andalasian. This way, magic wouldn't have been the solution to the problem, but something actually meaningful. Plus, I hate that Morgan seems to have forgotten her love of magic and fairy tales from the first film, and I feel like this route would let her heal her inner child, in a sense. Something that I think epitomizes this film's lack of ingenuity is with the wishing well. In the original film, the portal to Andalasia is literally a manhole in the middle of Times Square, arguably one of the worst possible places you could ever fall into. In Disenchanted, there's none of this cleverness, simply erecting a literal wishing well in the back of Giselle's new house. Wouldn't it have been funnier to continue the theme from the first movie and place the wishing well somewhere less literal, like inside of a washing machine or something? The film's most creative choice is making Giselle the wicked stepmother, which Amy Adams plays brilliantly. But unfortunately, they seem unable to commit to the choice, with Giselle switching back and forth between the two at random. I would have much preferred it if Giselle had become the wicked stepmother right from the start, and stayed that way throughout the movie. And while Maya Rudolph is a fun addition to the cast, I just don't think the addition of a secondary antagonist made much sense for the film's message. If it's about Giselle and her family, then the conflict should have stayed inside the family. There can only ever be one villain, not counting minions or pets. 
or villains that you don't know are villains until it's too late. The film is filled with cliches, like Malvina being the stereotypical queen bee and Morgan's classmates treating her like an outcast. But unlike the first film, Disenchanted doesn't explore these tropes past a surface level. I think this could have been very easily resolved by having the Monroeville and the Monrelasia versions of each character actually be vastly different from one another. Instead of Morgan being bullied by her classmates right off the bat, why not have them be friendly to her? Then their mean counterparts in the fairy tale could be symbolic of Morgan's worries about their new home, with the magic effectively bringing her worst fears to life. I also don't think it made sense for the characters in Monroeville to be so cartoony, when it would have been more interesting to see them start off as actual people before turning into fairy tale tropes. The film's first act is decent, the second act is actually entertaining, but in the third, it all goes downhill. Every single conflict is wrapped up at an alarmingly quick pace, so the story loses all of its emotional weight, which results in an incredibly unsatisfying resolution. Part of the problem is that it feels like a bunch of different ideas mashed together, which makes sense considering there are four credited writers, and a common rule of thumb is that the more voices and ideas that are being thrown around, the more convoluted things can get. One thing I'll applaud Disenchanted for is that unlike a lot of recent sequels, it doesn't desperately try to seem hip and trendy by using random teen speak. The internet and social media are only mentioned a few times, and these moments are slightly cringy, but at least there aren't many of them, which prevents the film from becoming too dated too quickly. I'm also glad that the film didn't try to go super girl bossy with its message, a problem that Disney has had in a lot of its movies that revisit older IP. Disenchanted brings back the majority of the original cast, including Patrick Dempsey, Idina Menzel, and James Marsden, but they're given very little screen time and development over the course of the film, with the film pushing them aside in favor of newer additions to the cast. While the original film had recurring side characters like Nancy, the Bankses, Pip, and Sam, they were naturally integrated into the story, and more importantly, actually served a purpose. The new additions in Disenchanted feel forced and uninteresting, plus there's far too many for my taste. Ruby and Rosaline are Malvina's henchmen, a callback to other villainous Disney duos like Horace and Jasper, Pain and Panic, or Flotsam and Jetsam. In most cases, these duos are bumbling fools who are more useless than they are useful, and where the original film would have subverted this trope, Disenchanted leans into it. While Nathaniel begins the original film as a lackey with no self-respect, like Giselle, he's similarly affected by the real world, and over the course of the film, he's able to confront his insecurities and even achieve his own happy ending. In comparison, Ruby and Rosaline have no character growth, doing everything Malvina tells them to without ever questioning why, and they end the film in the exact same place they started. Honestly, all they really do is add some shallow slapstick humor, which isn't at all necessary. Edgar at the Magic Mirror is only there to give Malvina information, which is the exact same role the talking scroll serves but for Giselle, so I don't know why they were both needed. It's redundant. Since Edgar works at a coffee shop, something that everyone in town has access to, I think it would have been funny to see him become a magical form of Google, with people asking him questions of varying levels of importance. This would not only make his inclusion a lot more amusing, but also get rid of some of the other unnecessary characters. Speaking of unnecessary characters, Morgan's love interest, Tyson, is perhaps one of the most boring Disney princes in existence, which is saying something. He starts off as a generic jock with a heart of gold, and Morgan is immediately drawn to him, but this is never fleshed out, and I'm afraid that I don't wind up caring about their romance at all. I also think the addition of the new child is rather pointless, as all it does is set up Edward and Nancy giving them the magic wand. The baby, being a baby, has no effect on the plot, and throughout the film she just exists in the background, with her family barely interacting with her. I feel like if they'd had Sophia be older, there could have been an interesting exploration of the dynamic between the two sisters. Okay, well, uh, if you don't have a one for a fake daughter of Andalasia, I'm gonna go change. This was actually something that I thought the film would explore, since Nancy and Edward refer to her as a true child of Andalasia, and I thought Morgan might take offense to that and feel insecure about her place within the family. But nope. If you had Sophia and Morgan be closer in age, but with very different personalities, it could have highlighted how Morgan feels like somewhat of an outsider in her own home, thereby prompting her to lash out. 
This way, Morgan would not only have to come to terms with her own insecurities, but also express those emotions with both her mother and sister. Robert's character is similarly devoid of a story arc. It starts off interestingly enough, with the character having an existential crisis when he realizes he might spend his entire life commuting to and from work, something I'm sure many of us can relate to. But this doesn't really amount to anything, and when he decides to move his practice to Monroeville, it feels like an incredibly rash decision. Keep in mind, he only commutes for one day. One. At least if he'd actually missed something important, like a birthday or something, I'd get why he was freaking out. But in the context of the film, it's ridiculous. Once everyone is transformed, he takes on Edward's himbo role from the first film. But unlike Edward, Robert has no evolution. He spends the entire time trying to be a hero, but never examines why he's so desperate to become one in the first place. Plus, these adventures separate him from the other characters, which is actually detrimental to the pacing of the story because he spends the entire time wandering around. I wish they'd had him team up with Pip or even Edward because we'd be able to see how those friendships have developed over the years, as well as how the real fairy tale characters would go about solving these problems versus someone from the real world. It also feels like a huge waste to give Pip the job of stealing the wand back when it could have been an actual instance where Robert got to be the hero, besides the clock thing at the end, which is incredibly rushed. It also pairs him up with Tyson, which is a bizarre choice considering they've literally never interacted prior to that point. I feel like it would have made a lot more sense if there was actually tension in his and Giselle's relationship, with her sharing her desire for a fairy tale life, which could prompt him to try and copy Edward in the hopes of impressing her. This story arc would obviously be wrapped up by Giselle telling him that she likes him just the way he is. Also, I don't know if it's because they have such little screen time together, but Robert and Giselle have like no chemistry in this film, which is astounding considering that's part of what makes the original film so amazing. I love me some James Marsden, so I find him to be absolutely wasted in this film. He only pops up a few times and seems to have regressed since the first film, being even more of an airhead. Something which doesn't make sense to me considering he's not only been with Nancy, a human, for the past decade, but also because it's implied that he visits Robert and Giselle regularly. Surely he would have picked some things up by this point. He also gets left behind in Andalasia, and while it's meant to be a touching moment of self-sacrifice, I can't help but think he'd have served a greater purpose if he was actually around. Giselle has similarly regressed since the first film. I can understand her becoming dissatisfied with her normal life, but it never feels as though she actually confronts this internal conflict over the course of the film. Instead, the film's message is about the dangers of magic and the importance of family. Because she doesn't really express these concerns, it leaves her character feeling devoid of emotion, and the finale falls flat as a result. The film tries to set up the dynamic between Giselle and Morgan as one where Morgan is a difficult teenager who doesn't understand all of the things that Giselle is trying to do for her, but let me just highlight a few ways where Giselle isn't the greatest mother. First, Morgan makes a great point about her father already commuting to the city, so why couldn't she? Especially after she makes the point that she's been riding the subway alone for several years. Second, Morgan's clothes all burn up and she's forced to wear Giselle's laundry to school. Besides the fact that Giselle probably had other clothes to wear, Giselle also made clothing in the first film. Why would she have not made something for Morgan? It could have been similarly horrendous, but instead of wearing it out of necessity, Morgan could have worn it out of obligation, making her frustrations directed specifically at Giselle, not the situation. Also, at the end of the last film, Giselle is literally shown to be a fashion designer, so why are they suddenly acting like she doesn't have taste? Third, the entire vote for Morgan thing is just so cringy, and I don't know why Giselle would have thought that was a good idea in the first place. Which yes, is kind of the point, but it still doesn't make any sense. As I mentioned, I love Maya Rudolph, but Malvina is too generic of a villain, starting off as a stereotypical suburban bitch before turning into your run-of-the-mill evil queen. Plus, she's a little too over-the-top and hammy for my tastes. Susan Sarandon's Nerissa was far more interesting, being charismatic, sarcastic, and manipulative. And most importantly, she was actually a believable villain who had reason for wanting to kill Giselle and had a role in the story. Where most Disney villains have a lasting effect on the narrative, with Ursula turning Ariel into a human, Scar killing Mufasa, Mother Gothel kidnapping Rapunzel, and Dr. Facilier turning Naveen into a frog, Malvina is kind of just there. The only time she actually does something is at the end of the film, which is in response to something that Giselle does. 
If they were insistent on having a secondary antagonist, I wish they'd done something more interesting. Like her being an outsider wishing for popularity, then when she becomes the evil queen, it's her own dream coming true, instead of reality carrying over. Plus, it would have been funny to see Ruby and Rosaline start off as her bullies, then her lackeys, then eventually her friends. I also think this could have set up an interesting dynamic with Morgan, where Malvina is her confidant, which Malvina could eventually use against Giselle. Pip is the only character from the original film that I wish had less screen time in Disenchanted. In the first film, he actually served a purpose, teaming up with Edward to rescue Giselle and foiling Nathaniel's plans. In the second, all he is is bad comic relief, and all he does plot-wise is steal the magic wand back from Ruby and Rosaline. I also hate the way that he's introduced, appearing out of the wishing well just because. I think it would have worked a lot better if he'd come along with Nancy and Edward, but wasn't able to make it back because he took a nap or was picked up by some random kid or something. Besides these complaints, the voice actor from the first film, Jeff Bennett, was replaced by Griffin Newman, and it's very noticeable. And I found the character to be far more annoying and arrogant than his original counterpart, which is really unfortunate considering he's the narrator. If you ask me, Morgan is probably the most interesting character in the film, and she should have been the protagonist. But because of the film's understandable, yet predictable, focus on Giselle, Morgan winds up feeling like an afterthought. I wish there'd been more of an exploration into why she's so concerned about moving and why she's so frustrated with Giselle, instead of the usual, oh, she's a teenager line that movies love to use. Like the original film, Disenchanted is littered with references and homages to various Disney properties, but unlike Enchanted, these odes to Disney are far less inspired and imaginative, and the movie winds up feeling like a big game of I Spy. And just to prove it, let's go through all of these references rapid-fire style. We start off with what I believe to be an older version of Aurora and Philip with their young son, then Little Bo Peep reading a book to some sheep like Belle once did. Then we have a Pumbaa lookalike and a not-so-subtle Ray. Then we've got the three good fairies, Flora, Fauna, and Meriwether, a cricket-sized pleasure island, an entire sequence that is a modern take on Be Our Guest, a broom from Fantasia, Giselle's dressing gown resembles the fairy godmothers, live-action versions of Belle and Snow White's gowns, this classic Little Mermaid moment, Morgan walking through the forest a la Briar Rose, Rosaline and Ruby dressing up as the evil stepsisters, Malvina has Sleeping Beauty's spindle, Alice's growth potion, the Beast Rose, and Snow White's poison apple. Morgan also references both the animated and live-action versions of Cinderella's ball gown. And last but not least, Malvina steps on the magic wand in a way that is very similar to Anastasia, which was recently acquired by Disney. Those were all of the visual references that I could spot, but do let me know in the comments if you can think of any others. Like the first film, Disenchanted has both traditional animation and CGI, and for a project that was sent directly to Disney+, both effects are surprisingly good. I was especially impressed with the opening sequence of the film where they reintroduce the land of Andalasia. Besides being absolutely gorgeous, it actually gave me goosebumps because it reminded me of the films that made me fall in love with Disney in the first place. The animated sequences later in the film don't look as good, but I still enjoyed it. I know Disney is busy with their 100th Marvel spinoff, but I'd love to see the world of Andalasia revisited, perhaps as a TV series which follows both Edward and Nancy as the king and queen, or at the very least, an animated short. The other visual effects play well with the film's live action setting, plus they're used pretty sparingly, at least before we get into the third act, which as I mentioned, is the film's weak point. Disenchanted follows Disney's habit of expositional song, but it's missing the self-awareness that made Enchanted unique. They incorporate cliches of Disney songwriting, but don't bother to use them in meaningful ways, and at times they feel generically musical instead of Disney-specific. Enchanted began with True Love's Kiss, which is a classic I want song in the vein of Part of Your World or A Dream is a Wish Your Heart Makes, but it's actually a parody of the Disney princess trope where the protagonists meet and then get married the next day. Happy Working Song pays homage to Snow White's Whistle While You Work, but subverts the audience's expectations of cute forest animals by using rats, roaches, and pigeons instead. In That's How You Know, Giselle is joined by the City of New York, which is a commentary on the ridiculousness of the big numbers in other Disney films. The music in Disenchanted is far more simple in comparison. 
Although many of the musical numbers have references to other Disney movies, there's no deeper meaning. This is especially noticeable in Love Power, which samples Cinderella, Pocahontas, Frozen, and Beauty and the Beast. But in doing so, it loses any sense of individuality and is pretty forgettable. Villains usually have the best songs in any Disney film, and Batter is no exception, being reminiscent of Be Prepared, Poor Unfortunate Souls, and Mother Knows Best, but with a jazzy twist. Besides poking fun at past Disney villains, with Malvina and Giselle listing off various stereotypes of wicked stepmothers and evil queens, it's also unique in the fact that it's a duet, which are usually reserved for romantic songs in the Disney universe. It couldn't be a modern girl's review without talking about the costuming. Replacing Mona May is Joan Bergen, best known for her work on The Tudors. I'll be honest, I do think that the costumes are a bit of a downgrade compared to the first film, although admittedly, there were a lot more that had to be made with less of a budget, with Giselle alone having 10 outfits compared to the first film's five. Because of the film's fairy tale setting, many of the outfits are generically historical and fantastical, something that's fine at a quick glance, but hardly makes for a unique aesthetic, and I found myself missing the Art Nouveau influences of the first film. While I like Giselle and Malvina's wardrobe, which incorporates elements often associated with Disney villains, they look somewhat flat against the extravagant set designs. Also, I'm sorry, but how do you have a sequence in a clothing store where a character says, I'll try them all, and then not have an outfit montage? That isn't a trope subversion, that's cruel and unusual punishment. Do they not know who their target demographic is? While the villains looked okay, Edward and Nancy's clothing feels kinda cheap and costumey missing the over-exaggeration that was crucial to the Andalusian look from the first film. Although the fantasy outfits were rather hit or miss, the real wardrobe is much worse. I especially disliked Giselle's first outfit, not only because the pattern was too busy and it blended into the background, but the shoes were so bright and the skirt so short that you focus on her feet the entire time, which makes the choreography look way too rehearsed. The real-life clothing of characters like Malvina and Morgan is incredibly lackluster and weirdly dated, a problem that I often have with contemporary costuming. Disenchanted had quite the pair of glass slippers to fill, and despite how negative this review may have sounded, I actually did enjoy the movie, at least the first half of it. All of the actors seem to be giving it their all, even if at times it's too much, and there are some rare moments where you can catch a glimmer of Disney magic. It will never dethrone Enchanted's place in my heart, but I could see myself re-watching it if the mood was right. What did you think of Disenchanted? I hope you enjoyed this video, don't forget to like and subscribe, and I'll see you soon! Bye!